What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about investing in frontier tech. We have Jeff Clavier joining us on the show. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pumped for this conversation. For those who don't know Jeff's background, he is a veteran of the Forbes Midas list of top venture capitalists in the world. He's founder and managing partner of Uncork Capital, one of the original seed VC firms in Silicon Valley with over $500 million under management. Having closed 200 plus investments since 2004, including in companies like Fitbit, Eventbrite, Bleacher Report, Postmates, Bitly, and in companies that were acquired by Intuit, GameStop, Yahoo, eBay, Google, and Twitter. They're currently investing out of their $100 million fund six, making on average 15 seed commitments of $1 million per year in mobile, cloud, SaaS, consumer services, connected devices, marketplaces, and frontier tech, including AI, AR, VR, autonomous vehicles, digital manufacturing, material science, space tech, and synthetic biology. You can find all of their links in the bio below on courtcapital.com, as well as Jeff's Twitter profile. What a cool job to be able to see all of those fields and how they're impacting our world and be able to help fund the creative minds that are trying to build the future. It is the best job in the world. Uh, we see the future through the eyes of entrepreneurs and we're very lucky that our limited partners, the people who invest in us, and trust us with a very broad-based uh, sort of uh, set of topics we can invest in. And so... We're having a lot of fun. It's amazing to sort of meet people. This morning, I just had a, a meeting with someone who was uh, building robots uh, that were vacuuming offices. And the guy was just super passionate about it. And it was just an <laughs> awesome time we spent talking about vacuuming and robots. And this is a massive part of our future. Um, automation, robotics, AI, autonomous perception systems. Um, and just where is this all taking us? And what is the nature of this reality that we even find ourselves in the first place? Do you find yourself um, having uh, the deep, these like deeper also philosophical conversations with your friends, families, colleagues, the people you invest in about, you know, why are we even here? What, what is the purpose of this reality that we're in? We, I think as VCs, we try and sort of figure out what is the future that we're going to try and build mm -hmm. and then work backward to actually sort of, okay, what does that mean to have this sort of vision, 20-year vision, 50-year vision, uh, which is where it takes sometimes uh, when you think about artificial intelligence, full autonomy and things like that. But then be practical enough to figure out what can I actually invest in today, which will make enough progress in the next couple of years to actually raise the next round of financing. And so there is the aspiration, there is the, this is what I want to build, but then you come back to earth because there's always the need to raise more money at some point. And mm. so that, that sort of keeps us grounded on doing things which are actual sort of practical developments which can go to market within you know a few years of what we do. And I think you know for us, Frontier Tech, is where we've allowed ourselves to invest in companies where there's not an immediate sort of go-to-market opportunity. You're sort of saying, well, I'm going to turn the corner and I'm going to assume there's a market for it. And we know that mm -hmm. Frontier Tech is, is very tricky for that because, you know, no one really knows when autonomous vehicle technology will actually be ready for prime time. You know, it's soon and every day we're getting closer, but it's not clear to me whether it's one year, five years, or 10 years. I like how you put this in terms of the both how you feel and how the people that you work with and the entrepreneurs that are trying to build the future, the way that you guys see it happening is you see the new world that you want to build, and then you look at kind of today's physical reality, and you see what are the maybe some of the archaic systems in place, how do they work? What are the ways that we can actually physically execute and implement this and get it into um, the path, the trajectory that actually builds that new yep. world? And you have to be very both bold and imaginative and have this really sort of big vision, but then have the practicality of actually making it happen. 
And one of the big questions that we ask ourselves before making an investment is why now? Right? What are the key changes in terms of technology or society or you know, um, acceptance, social acceptance, for example, of a given you know, technology or service or, or, or concept that will actually sort of make it happen? And sometimes the why now actually fails because it's not why now, you know, it's like not now. It actually is too early. People will just not, you know, go and get into a, you know, self-driving car because it's just too risky because the technology, you know, it's, it works except at the edge. And and we've heard, unfortunately, you know, people dying because of that edge failure, edge cases failures. And we'll see, right, whether people actually sort of go for it. So acceptance of social acceptance or, or risk acceptance is a big factor in our decision making. Mm. Man, that's so hard. So you're 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 seeing both the current state of the world, the future that you want to build, the entrepreneur themselves and kind of their their own kind of blueprint. What is their blueprint? Are they doing exactly what they're meant to do in this world? Do they can you feel it radiating from them yep. that they're supposed to be doing it? And we need to feel that. Cuz unlike you know, when I, when, when I started my own journey on, on, in entrepreneurship, um, being an entrepreneur in France uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, basically meant that you couldn't find a job. And so you basically had to build your own company because no one would give you a job. And uh, when I told my dad that I was going to get into the startup game uh, a long time ago now, uh, 30 years ago, his initial reaction was, I don't understand you've always had good grades. And you're like, what? <laughs> Come on, I'm telling you about what I want to do. And then you talk about grades because there was this issue behind, well, you've been successful at school, so you should find a good job. And by definition, being an entrepreneur is not being a, you know, it's not a good job at all. It's very, you know, insecure. It's no one knows whether you'll be able to uh, put food on the table and so on and so forth. And so I think, over the if you'll years, succeed at changing the world and building the future in in yeah. your own way, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so you need to see that dedication to the mission and the vision and the fact that uh, we try and, and get the sense that people will be able to walk through walls because that's what it takes to actually be an entrepreneur because it's so so hard and some some sectors are even harder than others. So it's never easy to build a great software company, but it's much more difficult to build a great hardware company and mm -hmm. if you add you know like the complexity of, of some of those new sectors like autonomous vehicles i think it's probably like one of the hardest things that you can try and build today because it's a lot of sensor a lot of hardware a lot of data a lot of ai lots lots of regulations and yeah. so it's just you're really trying to hurt yourself uh by trying to build those companies but what we try to um figure out is this burning desire of the entrepreneur that even if I tell you for three hours all the issues you're going to face, at the end, you'll still say, yep, yeah, but I just can't <laughs> stop myself. I have to do it. Yeah. And so that, that's sort of this commitment, that determination um, that we want to see because, you know, resilience is probably the, the number one characteristic that we want to see in entrepreneurs before they start because they will fail you know on the ground and have to go back up get back up and and try and make things work because it's never a straight path it's riddled with failures small failures large failures and you know you have to find the um the impulse to get out of bed every morning after a big failure and and get back to work i want to um hit the ball back with with two of the thoughts that you listed there. Um, one of them is these walls that you talked about. So um, I want to know that for all of those, to hear from you about this, from all of those that are aiming to build that future, mm -hmm. and there's all of these different walls that are coming up in the way. We talk about this a lot on the show as those walls are our gifts. 
that we get to overcome mm-hmm. and we get to learn and then we get to teach other people about how we overcame them and other people can then kind of go over those walls maybe more effectively and so um and walls was one of them and then the other one was kind of figuring out how to be humble along that path because even though you're resilient right mm-hmm. that if you're so resilient that maybe when you're getting good advice maybe from a venture capitalist like yourself or maybe when you're getting really good advice from a mentor that if maybe how can you gauge if that advice is actually uh the right thing for your trajectory and for overcoming those walls to get to that new world mm-hmm. so uh I'll start with the second one. So humility, I mean, <clears throat> I like people who are humble in their approach. I like people who are super smart, yet sort of listen to the ideas of others. Mm. The thing with an entrepreneur, you have to be humble enough to understand the reality in which you know, you're living and, and you know, the constraints that you have to deal with. Um, but you shouldn't be sort of humble enough to not try. So there is this fine balance between being humble enough, but not too much, and having a bit of that, you know, swagger and 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 you know, trying to just go for it because yeah. that's what you need uh, to be successful. So it's it's really sort of, and and what's hard for us is trying to figure this out because we're gonna spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs, right? Eight to ten years on average uh, for successful outcomes. Um, you mm. know, people in the portfolio. And the but, numbers are staggering. It's, it's around 96% of all businesses don't make it after 10 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, so we're going to spend a lot of time with them, but we spend so little time getting to know them. Because if you look at the typical sort of process uh, that we go through before making an investment, we're going to meet you know entrepreneurs three or four times. We're going to spend a total of maybe five to 10 hours and we try and sort of figure out everything about the business, about, you know, the team, about their motivation, about the potential, about the market and so on and so forth. Which VCs call due diligence. Which we call due diligence, absolutely. And there is, there is little time for actually figuring out the personal aspect and we try and sort of do that. The, you know, one of the things that we do at the firm is we will always make sure that one of us meets the entrepreneur face to face, which is actually sometimes not tricky because they may be, you know, in New York or somewhere else in the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least we invest, you know, in US companies, but we now have more and more international founders. So the, hey, we need to meet uh, means someone jumps in the plane. And you uh, gain a greater understanding of that due diligence from yeah, the eye to eye exactly. in person. You want to meet the person because this is something that is part of our decision making process because sometimes people are great you know in a zoom video remotely and yeah. they're sort of awkward you know uh face to face and 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 vice versa you could have someone who's actually not great through a video conversation because you have mm. this you know digital sort of intermediary in the middle mm-hmm. but it's actually great in a face to face uh setting so we try and we try and sort of figure this out so that's that's for humble the walls is basically all the issues you're going to face as, as a startup entrepreneur. And yes, we try and... So the, the key thing, at least in the way we think about our job as, as VCs is we'll never tell you what to do, what not to do. We'll just tell you in a circumstance like this one, which we're facing, this is what this company or this entrepreneur or you know, uh, this person in the portfolio has faced as issues and this is what happened and this is what we did to try and fix it so, so you story tell about other um yes. o- other times that entrepreneurs have faced similar walls and how they overcame or how they maybe failed to overcome just to- so that part of the storytelling is hey i'm not telling you i'm just trying to bring my experience or you know expertise and and story of 15 years of of um investments and, and many, many, many failures, failures to um, try and help you make the right decisions. But it's very hard to say, oh, this is like this company in this situation and so you should do this or you should do that because every, every company is different, timing is different. And, you know, I can tell you, well, 
Fitbit did this, you know, 10 years ago, but maybe it's completely irrelevant. So it's mm. more like here is a frame of mind and here is the decision making process that we used so that you can then analyze that and then recogitate and figure out what you want to do. So it's very hard, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, to have like a playbook that you can take from a very successful company and apply it to another one or another one. Like I could tell, you know, the successful journey of Fitbit to all my hardware companies, but it doesn't really sort of mean anything to them because they're all very different. Um, tactics can be useful, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the this notion of, hey, there's, there's a big wall here. It could be regulatory, it could be sort of uh, go to market, it could be, you know, production because actually building physical things is very very hard yeah especially at the right you know on time on quality and on spec yeah. and so all those things it's not because something worked for one company will work for others actually it's, it's pretty much certain that this worked for this one but it won't work for that one this really takes me in many ways to uh, tribal storytelling about successes that we had with maybe um, like immediate return hunter gathering where you went and you found the optimal places to gather or the optimal ways to hunt and you told the stories to the other people in the tribe in this way. It's telling the other stories to the entrepreneurs that are facing these challenges and helping them navigate through their journeys in building that yep. future. Jeff, for those that um, may be a little bit, um, this, is a, this is a very abstract thing to try and wrap our, our minds around, but there's somehow money, you know, is being put into funds. And then so you're pitching people to trust because you have a record, a track record, and they believe in you to manage their money to invest into companies in the seed around mm -hmm. $1 million investment level. And then, uh, and then you give those people, you know, you take about 10 or so percent at that, uh, at that seed investment level. And then you give them all these other things, these, these um, mentorship around the walls and yep. stuff. And, but then there's, you know, the, like all these numbers and cap tables, and then you have to reward those initial people that you had to pitch. So you're pitching people to, for your fund to then invest. Yep. Tell us about the complexity of that sheer system. I mean, you, you summarized it well. That's essentially the way, the way this goes. So um, 15 years ago, so I, I, I've been a VC for four years before I started in Cork. Um, and that's where I learned the basis of what it means to be a VC, uh, which was very useful. A lot of the people who are entering the seed space these days aren't actually sort of VC trained, which means that they discover on the, on the job what it means to be a VC, and that's tricky. So um, my first three years, I was just a business, business angel. So I actually circumvented the, um, like I, I so walked around one wall, which was fundraising. So um, I convinced my wife to take 250k of our savings. We had made a little bit of money at um, at Reuters, which was uh, the acquirer of my company, um, not a ton. And so we said, "Hey, 250k is going to be the initial budget. We're going to do a handful of investments, 25-50k checks, and and we'll see where it goes." And so 2007 is when I raised my first institutional fund, and essentially that's what happened. That told the story, uh, which was. Well, there is a gap in the funding market um, as bizarre as people sort of may think it is today to think about a funding gap where there was not there weren't that many people funding entrepreneurs doing seed stage of tech back in 2006 seven but it's true um, and so I raised one of the first uh, micro VC funds as we sort of call them at that time and I told a story about the potential, I told a story about you know these companies and what they were doing and why it would be a great idea to raise a small fund to write small checks to help them sort of get going and and the idea was you take a small risk in terms of capital but you get massive leverage because you invest very early at a low valuation and if the companies become multi-billion dollar outcomes then you'll make a lot of money. And at the end of the day, the people we pitch, the investors, we call them limited partners, are 
trusting us VCs with their capital because our returns are better than the public market. Mm. Because otherwise, you can mm. just invest in the S&P and, mm -hmm. you know, here you go. And so the pitch is, hey, I'm going to take $100 from you. And because we're seed stage, it takes a long time for our companies to be successful. And in, you know, eight years, I will return $500 or more, mm -hmm. uh, four or $500 or more. You're pointing and at something else also, which is potentially the future of, of micro investing. If people can put in even as little as just a hundred dollars into such a fund like yours and gain that much. In, um, in their yeah. case, it's small millions. As I was yeah, using yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, eventually we'll sort of figure those things out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if people sort of find your initial track record convincing and your thesis interesting and your story actually sort of works on them, then they will sort of write you a check, which is typically, you know, a few million dollars and you'll tell the story a bunch of times and most people will say no and eventually you'll raise a fund. And over time, we got lucky with fund two because it was literally and, and um, it was abnormal uh, to raise uh, such a weird new type of fund in such a short time. It was basically eight weeks also in the summer of 2007, uh, just before the uh, financial crash. Um, and then, you know, raising the next fund was much longer. And, and eventually, if you succeed, then raising money becomes something that happens very quickly. So our last fund, uh, fund six, as you mentioned, uh, was raised in just uh, a few short weeks. Wow. A few short weeks to get a hundred million dollar yep. fund. That's Actually, we raised two funds of a hundred million dollar each, so we raised two hundred million dollars in a few short weeks. Wow! Yeah, and then now the next the next thought around this is so then how do you and then the these are limited partners that are coming in and putting in the fu in the funding. How do you what what say do the limited partners get on where the money goes? What say do you and your partners at Uncork get in where the money goes? And then um, what do you what do you also like recommend for people in terms of observing uh, the emerging technologies that are coming into our world and uh, and how to kind of keep an eye on the complexity of that. Mm -hmm. So typically you try and, and give yourself <clears throat> the maximum flexibility in terms of where things go. So what you're going to, once again, you're going to tell a story to um, limited partners is one that we call uh, portfolio construction. So you're going to give them rough parameters. Um, in our case, we'll invest in 30-ish companies over three years. Um, average investment will be a million dollar ish and we'll try and get as you said you know 10 percent ish and the ish is actually important because it gives you flexibility yeah. i'm not trying to get like 10 percent a million dollar 30 companies no that's too yeah. restrictive rigid, yeah. rigid. Um, i'm basically giving them a sense of what they can expect yeah. um, i've been very clear with them that we invest in a lot of different uh you know, categories and types of technology and so on and so forth, including that crazy, you know, frontier tech sector where the probability of success is low, which means you can expect an even greater, uh, you know, percentage of failures in that category. But we may actually sort of uncover, you know, really interesting multi-billion dollar outcomes yeah. in, that, um, in that sector. And they sign up for that and you try and put in your legal you know contract which we call the limit the limited partnership agreement as few limitations and and rules and boundaries as possible so i think we can't for example invest more than 10 percent of the fund in any one company without asking our board mm. for permission mm -hmm. those kinds of things but in terms of individual investments, they have absolutely zero say. Whoa. None. Interesting. And, and that's the way it should be because either they trust you, mm. the investor, mm -hmm. and essentially it's, think of it as, hey, so here is, here is $100, the same $100. Uh, wake me up when you sort of send me back money and, and otherwise good luck to you. And 
obviously we're going to give them progress reports. We actually sort of um, issue a report every quarter, um, and we do an audited financial you know report once a year. So it's actually pretty formal. Yeah, yeah. But they don't. They can't say, "Oh, I don't like this investment. I don't want it." This is our our own decision, um, and that's that's the way it should be. Do those same principles go to the next level? So when you put in the million dollars into the entrepreneur, how much do you then get a say in what the entrepreneur is doing? Well, uh, as little as possible in the sense that, you know, it's the entrepreneur's company. And, you know, we invest super early so and we own 10%, so there's no voting control or whatever. Like, literally... If they don't want to listen to us, they don't listen to us. Um, and to be candid, we try and figure this out before we make an investment decision is whether the entrepreneur is going to be coachable and whether they're actually going to listen to us. Because yeah. it's their company. We will never tell them what to do, what not to do. But we'll give them advice. We'll tell them stories about things that happen to other companies. And we want to make sure that they actually listen to the data points that we'll share with them because that's really what we bring to the table is, you know, 15 years of investing at seed stage, 219 companies to date, wow. right? That we've seen go from zero to success or zero to failure, but there's always a bunch of key learnings that we can share. And it's up to the entrepreneur to, I think, respect those, um, the relevant uh, stories that we tell them and, and there's no point in telling irrelevant stories so that they f they take those into account before they sort of make their own decisions and so um, it's their company it's their decisions um, we try and give them just as m as much as we can from our experience and expertise and, and data points to make those uh, decisions as informed as possible yeah. in a world of you know, where um, in, at the early stage, everything is, is super early, therefore super, you know, it's like you have a lens and it's unfocused and you therefore sort of see a bunch of shadows and you can't really sort of see what's there. You, see, you know, there is something there and we just tell them, well, in similar situations, this is what the shadow was about. Mm -hmm. And then... You were on the board of the National VC Association. Yes. Okay, for four years. Yes. And um, just 2015 and 2019. Yes. And as uh, doing that, and you guys, are I assume, sharing best practices around what to, what, how to, how to um, make the e efficiencies in what you're doing, but also I'm curious if you guys are also talking about then with, about these uh, emerging technologies and how you're figuring out what are the places that you're, you know, you listed so many different fields. Mm -hmm. How, how do you guys keep track of the different fields? And yeah, that's, that's a really great question. So the um, National Venture Capital Association um, is really sort of the, the body that represents the industry uh, with regulators and government, right? So this is, uh, we have a team uh, of 10-ish uh, people in Washington, um, and they spend a lot of time uh, on the Hill to make sure that senators, House members understand, you know, what tech is about, what we need from them, what sort of, uh, what are the implications of any regulation or, you know, limitations or things that they may want to sort of set up as part of their day-to-day -day work because they don't really understand at all what we do uh, on the financing side, on building startups. Um, they sort of see, or at least until we sort of uh, did a good job educating them, they was just like this thing in California and, and startups were only about, you know, San Francisco and Palo Alto and definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. So we try and really one, educate and represent on one side and then bring all the concerns that senators and house members may have and work with, you know, our companies to try and, and get tech and Washington to work better together. And these days, it's actually really, really hard. Um, 
What so a I, crucial thing to get done, though, because yes. you guys also, as um, VCs, are also slightly unfamiliar with congressional processes, and so that, absolutely that way That's, it synergizes. That is, those that is two. very very true. Yeah. I, I was <laughs> I was you know surprised slash shocked when I when I showed up as a uh, newly minted uh, sort of board member of the NVCA, uh, which is a, um, a four year service, um, and it's good that. It's four years, you know, uh, of service because the first year you're like literally in learning mode. And you're like, what the hell is going on? Um, and yeah, they don't like when you show up like this. Uh, it's <laughs> it's really like suits and ties and tuck California and tuck yeah. shirts because yeah. yeah. like showing it like that like it's that a, is yeah. your out. Um, yeah. And so there's a formality uh, that is sort of amusing but but necessary because you know this is this is formal job. Um, so the, the symbiosis, uh, which is always sort of hard to um, uh, establish, is very, very important because otherwise they will make, I wouldn't say wrong decisions in terms of rules, regulations, decisions they will make, but they will sort of impact startups in a negative way and anything that impacts startups in a negative way potentially has an impact on the economy. And yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you look at the impact of successful startups, uh, an impact on creativity, on building the new world, and and jobs, and you jobs. know revenues and everything as well, right? So um, that's why the this role was was really interesting. To your point about how do we keep updated with um, the um, what's going on in uh, in the world of technology and so on and so forth. It's about keep, keeping track of the key sectors that you're interested in. It's about going after, you know, going to conferences, meeting, you know, scientists, um, having key experts you can trust and you will tap for advice and pointers and, and things like that. Um, but at the same time, remember that as a VC, most of what we see comes inbound to us so people are seeking you know capital and you know we're fortunate to have a great brand and great track record and people sort of come to us and we rarely sort of go and seek someone to mm -hmm. invest in them mm -hmm. what we do seek is advice and validation about you know going back to my uh, robotic vacuum mm -hmm. cleaner thing that um, I made this morning. Mm -hmm. If ever I was interested, I would go and, and seek advice about, you know, the commercial vacuum market because I know nothing about it. Yeah, um, yeah. I recently committed to um, a company in the lab-grown diamond uh, space. Yeah. I knew nothing about lab-grown diamonds at all. You now know, they're also doing four weeks ago. hair. They're doing it with hair, human mm -hmm. hair, with uh, ashes yep. too. Uh, Eternova. It's mm -hmm. such an interesting thing that you can take some of your child's uh, hair and uh, and do the high pressure carbon process to give your like wife a diamond of your mm -hmm. like child's hair. Like such an interestingly field that's yeah. and so you know the. In order to make an investment in something like this, you have to spend enough time and talk to you know experts and get sort of advice validation about the technology and then figure out that the market is kind of big enough. And so you answer the, the key the key questions about founder and founder market fit, uh, product, and you know market opportunity. And if ever the three sort of come back positive, then and you sort of like the entrepreneur and you see all the passion and everything we talked about, then you are to check. Yeah, yeah. And then how about on the, the processes that actually occur with um, figuring out the, you know, you were, we were talking about this earlier, this, this, this energy, this aura that you feel from the entrepreneur, their vision for building that future, their ability to do so, their coachability, all these, these, these really crucial things. Do you guys... Um, do you guys have some sort of like a process of also um, knowing <clears throat> knowing what 
future you want as uh, as as Jeff and as Uncork. You guys have this future that you want to this future world that wants to exist. And then do you guys kind of find the investment pieces? So if you guys say we want um, la- we want uh, to stop slaughtering animals, we want to grow meat mm-hmm. in bioreactors. So you go okay. So now this fund we're going to have a um, an investment in the lab grown meat space. Mm-hmm. And then you also say that you want to um, help um, people that um, may have some sort of of, of learning uh, disability or so, so uh, co- cognitive disability to then uh, have an augmentation of sorts through augmented reality mm-hmm. um, interfaces, new input output interfaces that helps them communicate with other people in the world. Mm-hmm. So do you then go and kind of like fund, so you see the vision and then you fund the the entrepreneurs that kind of help build that that new world so what you're describing is um uh is a thesis driven sort of firm that will have a set of whiteboards and say those are the um, the key sort of sectors or the key uh feature services um that we want to find a solution for and that's what they will go and do um and that's just not our approach because of the breadth of mm. what we do. So at the end of the day, um, and my, my wife runs the Center for Social Innovation at Stanford, and mm. she's into impact investing and social entrepreneurship and double bottom line. And she always say, uh, don't, don't even pretend that what you guys do is impact. You guys just, just you know, <laughs> after the money. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, when a company like Molecule improves the quality of the air we're breathing and helps people who have asthma to avoid ending up in ER because they, cl- they cleaned up the air that they had in their bedroom, yeah. it's actually sort of a positive impact. And she says, yes, and that's making the world better. So it's a world positive uh, kind of investment. And so that's, that's sort of the angle. We try and make the world a better place as people. That's, our, that's a statement. Yeah. But then we just see all those opportunities that come to us inbound and we're always thrilled to see them sort of improving people's situation example mm-hmm. we have a company called vivid vision a seed stage company in the in fund five and what those guys do is they use today's um, vr technology so goggles that you can find from you know oculus or um, even the gear vr from samsung and they have developed special programs to treat amblyopia which is, you know, crazy eyes, um, uh, crossed eye and things like that. Mm -hmm. And thanks to, you know, those treatments within a couple of years, you can basically have someone no longer have any amblyopia within a couple of years. Wow. At any age. At any age. At any age, which is really sort of brand new because, you know, the traditional technique, which is based on trying to exercise, you know, your eyes with masks and so on and so forth, uh, I think there's a limit of you know either 18 or 25 years old where you can't after that you can't really sort of do anything and this company is basically you know there's i think 30 million people in the u.s who have amblyopia and each wow. of them could be treated by um you know vivid vision yeah and so this is the type of stuff that we love um talking about on the show so much um when you have uh this this tie between money and power and status with building the future in a way that is truly um, about the highest possibility that our world can be. Uh, we love that so much, and that 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 process is is uh, if that, that that to hear that from you inspires us, and then hopefully um, we hope to see other because there's some bad. Uh, there's some people that also feel, and this comes from um, the a- the actions that people both observe and the way that people b- behave themselves, but just that there can sometimes be just a focus on money, just a focus on power and yeah. status. And so it's great to hear you talking about the social. But the, the point I wanted to make is that I had no idea, like uh, trying to sort of improve people's um, you know condition with amblyopia or people who have amblyopia uh, improve their condition wasn't sort of something I woke up to one day and said, oh, I'm going to go and do that, which is... wasn't your you thesis. Know, it like wasn't we my saying. thesis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was okay. just like, hey, we try and leverage technology to, in general, sort of make the world a better place. And sometimes we succeed in making like a dent, you know, in whatever the mm-hmm. world's misery is or, you know, bad conditions or whatever. 
and that makes us sort of feel pretty good. But at the end of the day, we're measured, you know, rightly or wrongly, by our success in returning a bunch of money to our investors because that's what we need, you know, to be able to raise the next set of funds. Yeah. And, you know... So that growth engine itself is a little bit strange. I mean, even that is... Because that, that's, that's the thing is that if, if, it's, if it's constantly about um, returning the funds, then some of the ethos can become shaky if, if, it's, if, it, if it's that pressure that's coming to return the money. Um, yes and no. I think yeah. it's, just a, it's just about choosing the endeavors that you back so they are doing good and their commercial success. Yeah. yeah. Which is not, yes. which is, you know, it's, yeah. it's not impossible Being at Being vigilant, doing the due diligence to do exactly that. So that would be such an important part of what I'm taking from this and hopefully others are too, is that if you, to be so first principled around the core pillar of the ethos of building the new world, that it, that it never has to um, become fragmented as you have to return the money mm -hmm. to the initial partners lps yeah that's, that's return the money thing. in multiples Remember, in multiples like, not just yeah, yeah it's not yeah, like you yeah. return the money thank you guys thank you, you guys. know that was fun it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you know four to five times is what they they hope as a, yeah. as a as a sort of stable stake and then maybe maybe there's some flexibility in terms of um maybe you only return um two times but you make significantly more social impact on one of the um uh, funds that you're yeah so there's yeah. there's all these types of things or maybe you make 10 times but you but you were more vigilant about the social um, impact yeah. side of things so I it's think possible everyone everyone is super happy that you're doing you're doing good as long as you sort of meet their uh, performance expectations and you know it's it's completely feasible I, I really sort of think it's there's no trade-off I mean there is some trade-off but you can sort of figure out a way to perform for your investors, people interest you with their capital and build companies that can make the world a better place. And then you can decide to not invest in things that you don't think are sort of on values. And we do that, you know, every day because for us to get involved in a company, one of us, there's three of us um, uh, partners at mm -hmm. Quark, one of us has to say yes I'm really excited to go and spend time with this company and help build it. And I know it's going to take 10 years of my life to get it to a large outcome, but I'm, I'm ready for the challenge and I'm excited. And, you know, sometimes we meet a perfectly fine, you know, idea, great team, interesting market, but no one has that sort of interest per se. So it's like, hey, anyone wants it? And we look at each other and we know that it means, well, if no one wants to pick it up, then it's not for us. Mm. And this is um, Ashley Cravens mm -hmm. and Charles Hudson. Are the other two? No. Um, Ashley has been with me for you know, a long Ten time. Ten years almost? Uh, almost uh, nine years. Uh, yeah. She's our director of operations. Charles uh, is a dear friend and was my first partner at mm -hmm. Uncork. Okay. But he's really sort of focused on what we call now pre-seed, which is oh, huh. very, yeah. very early stage investing. So my partners are uh, Stephanie Palmer and Andy McLaughlin. Okay. Stephanie and Andy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Hopefully we can um, continue doing things like sitting down with partners at the different uh, big v VC firms in Silicon Valley and help go through these processes of unpacking their journeys, unpacking their relationship to um, helping build that new world. Um, I love I love doing this and, uh, and hopefully we can do it more and other people can then gain the insights to also bring their creativity um, mm -hmm. to the to the world. Um, this is really close to our hearts as well. Um, the distribution of the rewards. Earlier, we were talking about um, a microfinancing. Yep. And that's very interesting. Doing something like instead of needing to put in 50 million into your yeah, fund, it becomes something like, hey, Alan, do you have 500 bucks? Because with 500 bucks, you can, take, you can invest into Uncore Capital's fund. This is, because, this is the really hard thing we were talking earlier about these cap tables and the yes. Securities and Exchange Commission and blah, 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 blah. This, this part's really hard to figure out. But as we do figure that out, and maybe you know these these decentralized immutable ledgers become part of the process, um, that 
then you can maybe make eight times on your 500 bucks and you can really quickly find outlets that are better than, like you said, stock markets mm -hmm. in, um, for getting returns and we can distribute rewards better. Um, or, yeah, how do you guys feel about, about that process? And as emerging technologies come into our world, how to best like include like an inclusive stakeholding mentality if like we always use this example it's a very convenient one like a ride sharing company can the drivers get part of the success can the riders get part of the success can the community that like the company operates in can they get part of the sex can the environment yeah. can future generations get part of the success um that's i mean we could spend two hours on that um i think the it would be it would be awesome if we could sort of figure out a way to do what you just described. The challenge is it's a very, very complex regulatory environment and we need the regulators to just define the rules because as much as I would love to, you know, take a hundred bucks from, you know, uh, anyone and turn that into four or 500, the problem is it takes 10 years, remember? So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they may sort of not like, they may like the outcome, they may not like the time it takes. But... At the end of the day, we are sort of regulated in a very, very specific environment. And I can, I can actually not take, you know, money from anyone who's not a um, uh, accredited investor. And actually, yeah, it's yeah. even worse for us because our fund is uh, what we call QP only. So qualified purchaser, which means even if you're an accredited investor, if you don't have you know, a lot of money, then you can invest with us because we decided to, because um, there are very specific rules and limitations. Uh, for example, you can't have more than 99 investors if ever you go for a um, accurate investor uh, sort of fund, whereas the kinds of funds like us don't have it, that limitation. So we, we basically raise money from people who have made a bunch of money themselves or from institutions. Like by now, 95% mm -hmm. of our capital comes from institutions. Uh, but if we, I hope, uh, Reg D and, and a lot of sort of those um, advances in, in microfinance allow us to actually sort of make money for these people. And it could be directly or indirectly. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure at some point something is going to be figured out because there's no reason that we can only serve with very specific high performance financial products that people already have a bunch of money. Um, I think the one regret I have um, mm. is that, you know, we have a bunch of family offices and funds of funds and people we're very proud to have as, as LPs, but I would have loved to have a, um, a you know, hospital as a limited ah. partner so we could actually return you know, a bunch mm. of money and then see the impact that our financial performance has on that community. Yeah. So I'll, uh, that's, that's, on, my book, that's on my bucket list. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so there's all these different ways to kind of um, uh, codify the... Um, the, the, the protocols and the structures that then um, make it so that the um, emerging technologies, the financing of the emerging technologies can then distribute the rewards to um, more people and to more um, social good. And that's a huge part of our, um, of our, of our new future that, that mm -hmm. we, that we want to build. Um, yeah, one of the ones we were mentioning this before we started, but um, interdependent capitalism, um, redesigning the social contract through inclusive stakeholding, the incentive prize on incentives. These are all things of the mm -hmm. Yoon Family Foundation that we applied for and that we always highly recommend our, our viewers to check out because that style of, of a process is um, is so deeply part of, of our social fabric of the future. Um, Jeff, I want to ask you also about... Um, what are your thoughts on um, many uh, of the cultures around the world from, we, were to, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but these ideas of the tribal days, of the um, immediate return hunter-gatherer days, there was this deep, passionate interconnectedness with each other mm -hmm. and the environment around us. And it almost felt like there was no set, there was way less separation. Mm -hmm. The West brought in the individual, and it was both incredible in many ways, especially you know entrepreneurially, mm -hmm. creatively, but also it created a, a, a more separation mm -hmm. as well. How do you feel about our disconnection from nature and its effects on the world that we live in? 
Well, certainly that that's that's a massive issue as we you know we live through massive wildfires which have been created by um, you know climate change uh, in California, and we are unfortunately with the government which has reaffirmed this morning that would um, walk away from the Paris Accord, right? Uh, and so that means they really don't care about the environment. Um, I do think that it's um, a shame that not more people are actually thinking about the world we're going to live uh, with our children. I have, you know, a 22-year-old and 19-year-old. And, yeah. you know, if you look at the state of the planet that we can leave um, uh, to them, it's not brilliant at all. And unfortunately, we don't see a ton of entrepreneurs sort of focusing on, on that in terms of major challenge and how to deal with you know, plastic pollutions or things like that. There are a few, but they tend to be more on the non-profit side. And that's that's always sort of um, something which I find a bit too bad is how can you figure out how to do good and build a sustainable sort of, you know, company at the same time? Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer unless, you know, we think about, hey, once we help people sort of make a bunch of money, then typically they start um, being more active in philanthropy and then they start giving a bunch of that money. But that's, that's, that cycle is not satisfactory. I, would, I wish people sort of could figure out how to, you know, improve the environment while sort of building sustainable sort of companies. Interestingly, you were talking about, uh, you know, companies building those meat alter alternatives Mm -hmm. And they are, it sounds like, successful financially yeah. while making the environment actually sort of better because yeah. it comes, you know, it consumes so many resources, water and electricity yeah. and so on and so forth to uh, to grow meat versus yeah. those other products. Yeah. So I think there are ways to find, you know, mission and business and and bring them together. And for certain things, there's just not going to be, we have to be, we have to be fine with the fact that there's not going to be a profit incentive. Mm -hmm. And then we need to create new funding vehicles for those solutions. And that's a whole part of venture capital that needs in its own way a new new vehicles within venture capital. That this is not something that's a five times return after 10 years, but this is something that is funding crucial science, crucial entrepreneurship, crucial reconnection mm -hmm. back to our environment and nature. That is not something you're going to get a return off of, but is rather making it so that our, hab our environment and our interconnectedness with each other is sustainable and prosperous for your children and their children, mm -hmm. etc. Yeah, and unfortunately, the 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 way sort of that that's what I was I was talking about right. You have sort of venture capital and and very specific sort of mandates in terms of funding, and we'll do really crazy things, but they have to build. We have to believe that they will build a sustainable sort of company at at some point in the future, even though. You know, we've we've seen all those companies sort of go public with massive uh, losses and and still sort of making more losses, and you wonder like where the sustainable part sort of comes from. And then there is you know um, fundamental research, which is typically sort of uh, government funded or you know philanthropic sort of work uh, like the Gates Foundation. And what's interesting is this feedback loop where you see Bill Gates, you know. Um, Founding sort of Microsoft becoming the number one or number two uh, sort of uh, wealthiest man on the planet, depending as to whether it's him or Jeff Bezos. But then him through his activity, yeah. redistributing, um, I mean, he's committed to uh, redistribute pretty much everything he's made yeah. for very key causes where he will literally change the face of actual disease thanks to the funding he gave for uh, polio, you know, polio yeah. and things like yeah. that. And so think about Malaria. having a global yeah. impact on a worldwide basis thanks to the work on, of one man who's made a bunch of million, billions and is super smart and he's trying to take his entrepreneurial sort of mindset and apply it to uh, causes. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, like that, that, that totally. actually sort of works as long as you do totally. it. And so... Totally. So there's funding vehicles already like that yep. that you listed, yeah. And so then, yeah. you know, it's, it's about you go to Jeff Bezos and you go like, your turn. Yeah. So.
Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of it as well. Completely agreed. Um, I want to know about, um, about your experiences um, with feelings of non-separation and interconnectedness. How about your feelings with that? Have you had experiences in that area? Um, well, I think that on one side, um, technology sort of makes us closer because you can really sort of spend, like when uh, almost 20 years ago, um, we went to visit my parents uh, who live in a small town of France called Tours. And we brought them a computer, didn't have a computer. And they're like, what is that? <laughs> and we're like, well, we're about to move to Silicon Valley. It's on the other side of the planet. We'll be nine hours ahead of you guys um, or behind you guys. Um, and so we'll talk through the computer and we'll buy, you know, video cameras and we'll use, you know, programs to talk to each other because we won't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm grateful for the technology that allowed us to, and in 20 years ago, what you were seeing was very grainy, you know, yeah, <laughs> bitmaps yeah. yeah. that were that were not, you know, super high res. But over time, the technology sort of um, uh, improved and, and now we can do a pretty good sort of video conference, you know, uh, for an hour every Sunday so we can spend time together. So um, I'm, I appreciate that connectedness. The, the problem is that we are now we've pushed it to the extreme, and you know, literally, uh, it's not uncommon to see two people uh, who are having dinner, and they sort of just look at their phone respectively, and they don't even spend time together, and they don't make eye contact, they don't do anything, you know, like they don't they don't share anything. It's just like there's a, a personal experience where I'm here with my phone in my own world, and I'm not really sort of connected to the reality I'm surrounded by. And that I despise. Maybe something around craving silence is one of the keys there. The process of inspiring those feelings of interconnectedness to all. To, to really understand that the trees, what they breathe out, I breathe in, and the cyclical processes that occur on the planet like that. It's. I think it's about... Um, uh, one thing I've I've sort of seen um, as I grew sort of older, I'm 52 now, um, is it's less about what you have or own, it's more about what you experience. And so now it's much more about, hey, can we go and do something together and experience something as opposed to buy whatever. So like, okay, well, yeah. we buy stuff because we have to and, you know, uh, or, or um, society is very consumerist, but uh, I really sort of value just the simple things of, you know, a um, sharing a, a nice sunset or a walk or being somewhere together and, and do something. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, these are some of our ending questions that we love asking, do you think that humanity is a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence? They would have wiped us out. I think they would be very disappointed if it was true. I'm sure they would delete us. Because if you look at what we've done to the planet, uh, the superior human beings or superior intelligence or superior AI that would sort of look at um, our, um, our output would say, okay, let's just restart. You know, sometimes you just say, not working. Stuff from a clean slate, boom. So, do you think it is our destiny to build that super intelligence as biological humans? I don't think we'll build it by, we'll stumble into it if we do. A crooked tree. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, there was a bug and it just created the singularity that everyone is talking about. What has been your most profound experience in this reality? Oh, um, seeing my two children, you know, being born. And why? 
because you suddenly you sort of realize that you actually created life. And so I remember when, I, when the first time I sort of held my son um, on May 1st, 1997, um, and he, he was, and, you know, my wife and I had just created life. That was very, that was very profound. And, and I had the same feeling, you know, when, uh, when my daughter was born uh, here. Um, Stanford is a great hospital, by the way. Yeah. Incredible sort of, uh, you know, uh, being supported by them. It's, it's, we've had, we've been fortunate to have a lot of experience, but I think nothing sort of um, compares to um, having your firstborn or your secondborn in, uh, in your, in your arms. Yeah. Yeah. That's a frequent answer on the program and it's a deeply profound one. Yeah. I'm not surprised because I yeah. think, you know, of all the things that, you know, you can do as um, as a um, uh, human being giving life is the most profound i would be curious what people sort of say if they haven't had children yeah 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 exactly because that could be sort of a personal experience could be a trip could be you know um one of the best memories i have of of my travels was being in um, in south africa in the uh, in the kruger park uh just walking around the bush and and you know seeing all those animals in their environment uh, in the purest most pristine kind of environment it was just incredible i wonder if birds also think that when they fly over cities and they're like look at all those animals in that environment uh, <laughs> yeah you wonder and then how about uh, do you think that this is a simulation do I think if it's a simulation? So, you know, in the Matrix, um, uh, when the guy is about to eat a steak and to drink a, a very expensive sort of bottle of, of Bordeaux, and he says, I know that I'm programmed to sort of like it, but I still like it. I'm, I'm a huge wine fan, so as long as I can appreciate wine, I will be fine. Un uncork. Uncork. Funny, funny you say that. Yes, the name of our firm is Uncork, but it's really about uncorking innovation and yeah. you know the twist of energy. Uh, that's what this this means: the twist of energy when you open the bottle, and the uncorking innovation. Uncorking innovation, yeah. yes. Um, and the person who helped us rebrand, because before that we were called Softech, uh, we were branded two years ago, um, is a, uh, a professor of branding at um, at Stanford. And he knew nothing about Your my side passion for wine. <laughs> and he listed yeah. 10 names that were his recommendation. And the sixth was Uncork. And it was actually five he recommended and five he would be happy with. And it was the second column. It was like, why would Uncork be not your favorite? Because, oh my God, this is so good. Um, and it was like, well, it's slightly negative, un, and you don't want to have something like a mm -hmm. venture capital firm to have a slight negative connotation, but and, and we're just laughing because all of us sort of enjoy wine and, and we have more bottles of wine in our office than the rest of VCs combined, you know, you know in the valley. Because uh, you never know, you may need 400 bottles of wine, right? Why not? Um, and that's where, you know, we decided to uh, go for Uncork and, and when we rebranded, our founders uh, sort of gave us a uh, standing ovation because we announced it at uh, our um, uh, founder summit mm. and they were so happy that uh, the old soft tech was gone and then cork was uh, was born the new brand yeah what do you think is the most beautiful thing in this reality when you can experience nature in a way where all the downside and all the you know stupidity of of uh, us humans uh, and and our degradations you either don't see it or you're not exposed to it, um, that would be it. So maybe that is the new world where there isn't that um, stupidity and those downsides, but that we have. The problem is that prosperity. we've done so many bad things that getting nature back to just an equilibrium requires a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly. 
Yeah, and we talked a lot about all of the different uh, ways that um, social good comes out of um, what is happening in venture capital and also about how um, these new funding vehicles for inclusive stakeholding and all these other ways of um, bringing forth the new world and entrepreneurship is such a critical pillar in building the new world. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate you coming on. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about investing in frontier tech and all the other subjects that we talked about on the episode. Let us know what your thoughts. Also, check out the links in the bio below again to uncourtcapital.com. Also, Jeff's Twitter profile. Check those out. Thank you, Ori Shapira, for co-producing. Thank you very much. Also, Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders in your communities that you believe in. Support them and help them grow around the world. You can support Simulation. All of our links are below. Help us grow. Help us prosper as well. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you soon. Peace.